Christians around the world begin this day to await the advent of Christ. We join with a joyous and hopeful throng. I'm sorry, I'm a little emotional. In lighting the advent candles, symbols of our faith and signs of God's love. Yes, people of hope. <clears throat> Christian people around the world stand today in breathless anticipation of a miracle that has been repeated for hundreds of years, yet that astounds us anew each year. As we light the first Advent candle, let it stand for hope, based not on wishful thinking, but on deep conviction. We believe, we have seen, we have received the promise and the great gift, and therefore, in the midst of darkness and imperfection, we hope. We <laughs> commitment. We have heard that a special child is to come, that God is to be among us, and that soon we will see a new creation on earth. We are people of hope. Our scripture reading is from Matthew 25, 36 through 44. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. 
But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have left his house be not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. This is the word of the Lord. at a marching band competition the other day. I meant to cheer for one of the youth, but in the process, I got to see other bands. They were all good. The music, dancing, and rhythm carried, carried me away to a happy place. While I was humming and tapping my feet, I noticed the drums in all the performance. The beat had to be there. Tap, tap, boom, boom marked the passing of time. The seemingly empty space of time has to be marked by these con constant drums because without them, the performance will not be synchronized. The dancers will be offbeat and the musicians cannot find harmonious notes together. Without the drums, the whole thing would fall apart. The beat kept structure to the whole performance. Then I realized time itself, time itself in our, in our world is like that drumbeat. In Genesis 1, 
God marked time after creating light. It says there was evening and there was morning the first day. Imagine before this first day, there was no time. And when I saw the bands marching to the rhythm of drums, I realized maybe time is like that for us. It keeps structure to the sequence of events in our world. Without it, we would not know when things start or end, whether things happen con consecutively or concurrently. And if you're not mindful of time, then we're, li we're liable to experience life as like a blur. When we're young, and then all of a sudden we're middle-aged. We have a little baby cuddled next to us. And then we see her graduate to high school and run off to college. Without marking time, life could be a blur. Or without keeping track of time, life seems like a bore, a long, meaningless wait until something really exciting happens. We couldn't wait until we got out of high school and then to college. Then after college, to a career, and then to marriage, then to kids, retirement, and finally something really exciting would happen, right? We didn't realize that life is happening, even if we thought that we were just waiting. The existence of time is like those drum beats. It's reminding us this whole universe is this great big marching band of performance, listening to the beat of God's drums as we synchronize our lives to his beat. Well, today is the first Sunday of Advent. The intent of Advent is to point out to the believers about the second coming of Jesus. But the spiritual meaning of it is to waken us to life, to make us realize that Jesus is already in our midst, working, active. He is Emmanuel. And I want to remind you today, as Jesus reminded his disciples 2,000 years ago, that we should be very perceptive to the present. More importantly, we should be perceptive to the work of God that's being done right here, right now. Our text that Karen read is part of a longer teaching that started with Jesus predicting the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. And this alarmed the disciples. Tell us this, they said. When will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming? And at the end of the age. There were three motivations behind that question. One, the early church, as well as the Jews at the time, were very concerned about the end time. They were, they were always asking, when will this terrible world end with a loud bang? Two, they wanted to be reassured that Jesus was in control of history. They were worried that the world will unwind and spiral out of control. Third, and this was the most important factor in their question. And the basic assumption was this. When should we shape up and get ourselves ready for the big event? The question was stating this. That's a, this is an assumption of the, of the disciples or the early church. We want to know when you'll return, Jesus, because we are like living sometimes a sloppy lives and less attentive to you. But when things really matter, like when you're coming, we want to prepare ourselves to be in tip-top shape. So tell us, Jesus. When is your return? Jesus recognized the loaded nature of their question. Therefore, he said, this is what he said exactly. About the day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, wink, wink, but only the father. In other words, he emphatically says, this is not something you should be concerned about. 
At that time, and even today, so many faithful and sincere Christians have been caught up in end-time prophecy. So many people, so many books, so many movies, so many hours, so many days, worrying, guessing, disgusting, being obsessed with the end times. And Jesus tells them very nicely, this is a complete waste of your time and effort. Instead, Jesus was pointing out, they should worry about wasting time, living without purpose, and pursuing pleasure as their main focus, just like in the days of Noah. They were not mindful of the rhythm of time marching so they could, so they just wanted to do their own business without care for society, for others, and about God. So therefore, Jesus tells him a very shocking parable, the parable of the thief. The two surprising elements in these parables are that first, God is likened like a thief. This is shocking because a thief is going to intrude into your life, violate your space, and most of all, steal from you. Jesus was pointing out the hypocrisy of those who fret and worry about the return of Jesus, the end of the world. The attitude was this. Hey, we have a good thing going on here. Why are you going to interrupt us and take away our beautiful arrangement? That's why Jesus wanted to poke at them and use the metaphor of a thief. Second, even though Jesus seemed to be warning his disciples to watch for his return, he says at the end, the return of the Son of Man will be at an hour unexpected. In other words, he's saying, you can watch for my return, but you will never know. What? What are you, what are you talking about? See, the way Jesus grabbed their attention, this was very important text in the book of Matthew because it's written to the early church where people tended to not pay attention to their faith and they were just going about their business as if he, his life didn't matter. So he gets their attention saying, look, the temples could be destroyed. Look, I will return. There'll be terrible things happening. There will, God will come like a thief. And everybody, even when I was a child, I didn't really read the Bible that much or read it with any attention. But I paid attention to that text. Ooh, when, when could I shape up? I would have, anyway. <clears throat> See, Jesus was trying to draw attention to people who never got him. Therefore, he uses fear and danger to heighten their attention. But Jesus leave him hanging. He said, so you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come in an hour where you don't expect it. Do you see the paradox in that statement? That's Jesus' double talk. You really have to think about that. To realize that Jesus was saying, don't worry about my return. That's not your concern. Just live your life right. There's a huge and profitable uh, book series called the Left Behind series. The main message is that you better watch out because if you're not careful, you'll miss the rapture. Then you will be left behind to suffer all the horrors of end times. The authors, however, seem to miss Jesus' point. If you read our passage that we have today very carefully, it talks about the days of Noah, when the flood came and swept away those who are sinners. So to be left behind is a good thing, right? But in the book, to be left behind is a bad thing. They did not understand the message of Jesus. The whole point is this. Jesus is asking us to live, our, live with a heightened sense of God's work in our present world today. To recognize that Jesus is here with us. I felt him 
when I help read. And not overly stress about the end times. The main point is the word, is contained in the word watch. And there are three ways that the word watch is used in the book of Matthews. It says one, Matthew 24, 4, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out that no one deceives you. Second way the word watch is used is seen in Matthew 26. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Watch so that you are always in relationship with God. The third way is not stated explicitly, but it says it's strongly implied. Watch that you don't neglect the responsibility to others to take care of those in need to work diligently for the betterment of society. This is illustrated in the parable of the goat and the sheep, where the sheep took care of those who are in need. This is the thing about end times. The main problem with people who are overly obsessed with end time is this. They forget to do the necessary work of improving the world today. Because their thinking is, the world will end like a dumpster fire. We're going to be swept up in the rapture. And all that mess behind, they're going to suffer for their crime and their sin. If you really think about that, that is a very selfish theology. What Jesus is pointing out is that, look, watch, because I am working with you. Watch, because God is active today. Watch. There is miracle, beauty, performance that's leading to the glory of God. Participate in what God is doing today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, right? I want to remind you that in the season of Advent, to see all the beauty of God in the world, realize how much God loves us and the world. And he sent his son to be with us, to be with the lowest and the downtrodden. We are continuing that ministry of love, that performance that started by Jesus 2,000 years ago. We're we're marching. We're like the marching band. I'm the flag holder. <laughs> Not a good dancer or musician. And it's marching on and we are synchronized to the ways God is working in this world. Let's celebrate God's wonderful presence and work on earth today. Can you hear the beat of the holy drums? Marching us on forward? I do. I hear it when you guys sing. I hear it when you guys pray. I hear it when you guys serve others. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, the existence of time reminds us that you're the band leader as dancers, musicians, and banner holders. We move to the beat of the holy drums. Let us not miss one moment so that we could fully participate in this marching band piece called Precious and Lovely Life. This Advent season, we don't wait for your return, but we enjoy your presence here today. We pray all this in your holy name. Amen.
Thanks for joining us. If you're interested in visiting us in person, we are at the corner of Liberty Meeting Court and Sugarland Road. Look forward to seeing you soon.